morning and welcome to RTO Doctors 30 Days 30 Tips. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about poorly constructed units of competency and the significant impact that they have on compliance. Welcome again. Hopefully the previous hopefully the previous uh, videos have been of some assistance to you. Uh, I'm just not sure whether or not that beginning of the video actually started properly. Uh, something happened to my screen. So just in case, uh, I'm going to repeat myself. So given that there's uh, very few people at the moment anyway, uh, tonight's uh, 30 Days 30 Tips uh, comes to you again from RTO Doctor and it's in relation to poorly constructed units of competency and the significant impact that it has on compliance. Um, recently, um, I was part of a technical advisory group for a training package review with Oz Industry Standards. And for me, I, I found it to be a, a really helpful experience in terms of developing new training products because I was able to provide the training package developer with unique experience about how ASQA auditors are interpreting these units of competency and the impact that that is having on providers when it comes time to not only having their assessments uh, audited by ASQA auditors, but in terms of uh, developing observable behaviours uh, that students have to demonstrate in the workplace and also the evidence that's collected um, for um, demonstration of competency by students. Um, what I'm finding is that that is probably one of the most effective ways of improving um, all of our current training products. It, it's really helpful and my experience with Oz Industry Standards was that they found it very helpful as well to be able to integrate that um, experience of the live experience of how it's being interpreted um, in the real world by ASQA auditors. And so it's in that context that I wanted to talk to you about um, poorly written units of competency and their impact on compliance tonight. Um, the, more so the construction of units of competency and where ASQA auditors and observable behaviours collide. There is often a real mismatch between what is expected by the unit of competency, as in the intention of the unit of competency, and the expectation of ASQA auditors. Um, recently, I was presented with the requirement to demonstrate a range of requirements in a unit that really it's just completely and utterly compliance gone mad. Um, unfortunately, this is at a, a higher level of appeal and it's not an um, everyday face-to-face -face audit or even a Zoom audit or a team or, Teams audit. Um, but it's usually as a result of a handful of auditors that these issues arise. Nonetheless, they can become problematic to manage and for providers who are just undergoing an audit, um, just an ordinary audit, they may never know or not have any idea about which auditors really behave in this manner and which ones don't. Um, it's almost like the, the luck of the draw. Mostly these issues arise because there are auditors out there who have never set foot in an RTO, they've never been a trainer and assessor, they have never been involved in industry as such and they are for what I call, I, I've often been heard referring to them as nothing more than glorified administrators. Um, when you get a glorified administrator who occasionally gets a tick and flick diploma of quality auditing, if they're lucky, um, this is where these sorts of um, issues arise because they choose to audit a unit of competency in a way that was never intended and it's not appropriate for current circumstances. Now, one example of this was during COVID when the, the Australian Resuscitation Council explicitly stated that first aid and CPR delivery should be postponed until the pandemic had abated and expert consensus was there were no longer any risks in participating in courses. 
um, over time that advice changed and it was based on your evidence available at that particular time by the Australian Resuscitation Council. Um, as that new research became available, they updated their, their guidelines and made it available on their websites. Now, the reason why this is such an issue is because at the time that this was happening, because some RTOs were completing their um, tasks in accordance with the ARC guidelines, um, they were no longer offering first aid and CPR delivery. Um, the ARC guidelines are explicitly written into the performance criteria, the performance evidence and the knowledge evidence and the assessment conditions. And, and what happens is these, these providers found that if they were to deliver the unit of competency for first aid or CPR in accordance with the ARC guidelines, then they would be in, in, in breach if they still had these classes despite what ASQA was saying. So what happened was um, this meant that for those RTOs who were seeking to demonstrate compliance with the training package and the ARC guidelines, they adopted advice from the Australian Resuscitation Council and they ceased delivery until further notice. However, when there were RTOs that didn't stop delivery and continued despite the recommendations, therefore information, um, sorry, therefore in breach of the training package requirements, the decision was based on information that was coming from ASQA at that particular time where they were saying that provided there were sufficient infection control and social distancing requirements included in the training and assessment strategy for the delivery of first aid and CPR units of competency, that that was satisfactory. And it encouraged all RTOs to, sorry, um, the position at that time was that because the Australian Resuscitation Council had just posted it on its website, and it was not included in the associated guidelines, providers were therefore able to deliver it. So it all came down to an issue of semantics. It led to enormous confusion because some RTOs closed and suffered severe financial loss. And based on what they were con they considered was the right thing to do at, the right, at that particular time, not just in terms of training package development, not just in terms of ASQA compliance, not just in terms of ARC requirements, but also in terms of public health and safety. So they closed their doors, but there were other RTOs that maximised the opportunity to deliver first aid and CPR in that context, um, in, in thinking about how it was implemented according to ASQA's interpretation, as opposed to the Australian Resuscitation Council. Um, it led to enormous confusion and some RTOs closed, some suffered severe financial loss while they considered what the right thing to do was. Um, there seems to be no body, and, and when I say no body, I mean no organisation or no, um, no body <laughs> that is in between saying this is right and this is wrong and it should be interpreted this way and it should be interpreted that way. At that particular time, um, I personally contacted uh, Skills IQ and obtained advice from them and they said the training package was as the training package was and it, they could not do anything about how a school was interpreting the advice of the training package and the art guidelines at that time. You needed to consult with ASQA. Well, you consult with ASQA and that was their advice to go against the art guidelines, but the art guidelines, it, it's a vicious circle. You get the idea. But using another example from the aged care qualification, I ran into this one recently as well. And I was asking myself, how do you develop an observable behaviour for respecting someone else's spiritual differences. Now, it's not quite as easily captured um, as an observable behaviour. It's quite easily to, to measure that as a knowledge assessment. But because it's expressed in the performance criteria, the assessment will remain not compliant until an observable behaviour for respecting another person's spiritual differences can be observed 
by the trainer and assessor and demonstrated by the student. So again, it's one of those things where it's highly likely that the training package developer never intended for there to be an observable behaviour for respecting another person's spiritual differences because there's not too many ways that you can do that physically as an observable behaviour. Another example is with the units of competency such as prepare and present sandwiches. I've pulled that one off TGA just earlier. Um, SITH triple C double zero three prepare and present sandwiches. And an example might be using this particular unit of competency to visually evaluate the dish and adjust presentation. Now that particular um, that particular performance criteria was at 3.3, visually evaluate dish and adjust presentation. Adjust presentation is in the range of conditions <coughs> and each of those range of conditions is mandatory by the virtue of the fact that it says adjusting presentation must involve consideration of and there's a range of different things. Those things include accompaniments and garnishes that maximise visual appeal, balance, colour and contrast. How does one develop an observable behaviour that someone has considered balance, colour and contrast? Um, also, just little things like somebody might be making a sandwich for a customer and the customer just wants chicken, lettuce and mayonnaise. How do you place adjusting presentation must involve consideration of all of those things if that is what the customer ordered. Um, there seems, and what this is really coming down to is that there seems to be a real disjoint between what the training package developers intentions are in terms of the unit of competency and the subjective interpretation of what is required by those units of competency by ASCO auditors. It should be noted again, as I mentioned before, not all ASQA auditors are like this. There are some ASQA auditors that absolutely understand that this was never the intention of the training package for it to do this, that and the other. But there are other ASQA auditors who, as I mentioned before, I label them as glorified administrators. They've never set foot in an RTO. They've never, ever administered an assessment in real life. They've never been a trainer and assessor. All they've done is answered phones and um you know, written emails and stuff and somewhere along the line they may have got a, a diploma of quality auditing through a tick and flick scenario. They will never understand on the ground how these assessments and how these units of competency should be interpreted. But there just seems to be this real disjoint that can't be fixed at this particular time. Tonight's tip, therefore, is to make sure that when you have something questionable that is required by a unit of competency, it's to go back to the training package developer and seek clarification in writing. Make sure that you specifically explain what the problem is, how you're interpreting it and why you think it might be a problem and ask them whether it was their intention, what their intention was meant to be and how they expected it to be administered. Now, once they come back to you in writing, which you would hope they do. Sometimes they might call you by phone and then they don't actually respond to you in writing. So you would email them back and say, I just want to con confirm that this is what you actually said. But um, once you receive that information back from the training package developer, what you should then be doing is going back to your industry that you engage with on a day-to-day -day basis for developing your training and assessment materials and making sure that your interpretation of the training package developers information remains consistent with what industry needs. Now you can then integrate all of that into your training and assessment documentation and when it comes to audit you can explain to the auditor when they question you well this is what the training package developer said, this is what industry said and we've merged all the information together and we're satisfied that this now meets industry requirements. 
Arguing with with ASQA auditors that they are wrong is not usually advised because ASQA will always stand by its auditors. They seem to believe that their auditors are qualified, experienced and know what they're doing, regardless if they're not. Uh, it has been put on the public record in Parliament. Um, then there's also evidence um, in the public. Have a look at the um, Twitter page of Education Issues Australia, if you haven't already. And that really describes in great detail some of the issues about the competency and quality of auditing um, from ASQA. And I personally have also written some articles in relation to this issue on LinkedIn, and it also features in uh, some of my books that I've published. So once again, arguing with auditors that they're wrong is not usually advisable and it's not necessarily going to work. Um, the best thing for you to do is to make sure that if you've got something questionable, go to the training package developer, get their interpretation of what it's meant to mean, go back to your industry, confirm that information with industry is what they would want, or if it's not, then document all of that, come back, bring it all together and integrate it into your training and assessment materials. And then if there's a problem, you've got sufficient evidence to go back to the ASQA auditor and argue your point that it's not relevant, doesn't make sense, this was never the intention of the training package. I welcome any comments, um, any questions, and that's about it for tonight. Uh, thank you very much for following and I look forward to tomorrow night's tip. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.